Hey, I'm TV Quiz PhD, and when I first plugged in a servo motor, I got this crazy erratic movement. It took me a while to figure it out, but I'm going to show you how through a combination of Googling, guesswork, and dumb luck, I transformed this erratic motor into the motor you'll see here. Now the motor moves once every 12 seconds. This is pretty close to what I was aiming for, and it's good enough for me. On the bottom we see some math that I'll show at the end explaining exactly how I get the motor to move at this rate, but for now, we're going to focus on the erratic motor and see how we can get it to stop moving back and forth like this by looking at the circuit diagram inside. Now we see the whole diagram of the circuit that I've designed here. In yellow we see the logic chips or integrated circuits as well as the servo motor in the bottom right corner. Just above the motor we'll look at the 555 timer which has three capacitors in this setup which you'll see in orange on the left or as the parallel bars on the right. And these capacitors slowly charge and discharge which sets the rate at which this timer fluctuates. This timer is used to control the servo motor. Normally, the waveform of the digital input will control the angle of the servo motor. In this case, it's behaving erratically because the digital input is varying unpredictably. And we'll look at the whole diagram to see why. I'll give you just a second to look at the whole diagram and then I'll zoom in on the problem. I have two different symbols for ground. This may make sense in some cases, but in this case, <laughs> these two separate grounds are the problem. I have two separate power supplies. One supplies the motor through this uh, power supply board. The other supplies the circuit through this 9 volt battery run through these resistors and into the rails of the breadboard. The reason that we see this effect is because this wire is connected from an external ground that is unrelated to the ground of the circuit or really maybe the only way to fix this, is to bring in this wire, which I can connect to the ground of the power supply for the motor, and then simply connect that to the ground of the power supply for the breadboard. To show my changes on the diagram, I'll simply make all the grounds have the same symbol, which shows that they're all connected. And then we see all of the crazy movement stops, and this will pave the way for me to actually control the servo motor. Now I'm setting up a second 555 timer. The configuration of this timer is set to have a much longer period than the timer actually controlling the motor. To do that, we'll have much larger capacitance and much more resistance. In the schematic for the new 555 timer, on the left, you'll see 38 kilo ohms used both in charging and discharging. In the middle, an additional 500 kilo ohms are used only in charging the capacitors. This means that the time in the charged state is much more than the time in the discharged state. And that's explained through the duty cycle. Okay, so I've finished setting up my circuit here. All right, well, I have no indicators. Let me get an indicator in here. So now I've got an LED that should show me every 20 seconds or so when this timer is active. I think it's much more normal for someone to have a large R2 and a small R1. And when I have a large R1 and such a small R2, I've got a quite strange duty cycle where I'm on for a long time and off for a short time. So we see we're on for a long time here. And now we're off briefly and we're back on. What I will want to do is simply reverse this LED. I haven't flipped the signal, uh, but I've flipped the LED indicator. And now the LED will only uh, light up for brief pulses at a time, which you'll see soon. There it goes. Okay, so about servo motors. How they work is that there is a carrier signal, which has to be 50 hertz. And then there's a smaller signal, which has to be the width of each pulse. Now this means the duty cycle has to be less than half, less than 50. This measurement here is going to be 0 0.02 seconds, or um, 50 hertz, which we have. But then each of these individual measurements has to be very specific, and it has to range from 
0 0.001 second to 0 0.002 seconds. All right, so now we need to do some math to calculate um, how to get those values with the capacitance that I know that I have. In a typical 555 timer, the width of the pulse depends both on R1 and R2. However, I've set up some diodes so that the pulse only depends on R1. You can see the diodes here in the diagram. Next, I'll ensure that the capacitors are only charged by one circuit path at a time. On the top, we have a smaller resistance of 440 ohms, and on the bottom, we have a larger resistance of 880 ohms. Now, the exact pulse duration depends on R1, which is given by whichever path is currently used to charge the capacitors. All right, in this case, the resistance will need to be 433 ohms, and in this case, that would be double that. So therefore, it must be 866 ohms. And these resistors, as I've measured, are a little bit too much. They are each 1,000 ohms. OK, I'm going to get as close as I can with four 220 ohm resistors, giving me 880, and two 220 ohm resistors, giving me 440. All right, time to plug everything in and see. That motor moved! Oh my goodness. I've never been happier. It's not perfectly stable, but when that light turns on, God be willing, this uh, motor will move substantially. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I've spent a week on this. Uh, I can't tell you, um, you know, how, how thrilled I am that this actually does something. Okay, here's the circuit as it was designed to make the motor turn periodically. Now, I'm going to zoom in on the capacitors and show you something crazy that I discovered when reassembling the circuit. The circuit works better with 3% of the capacitance that I thought was needed by doing the math. The reduced capacitance is actually what went into making this recording and this graph. Surprisingly, it behaved much more reliably than the capacitance and the frequencies that I calculated. Based on what I know, this much smaller capacitance should send a carrier signal of 1.7 kilohertz to the servo motor. But when I measure that signal, I get somewhere between 550 hertz when the motor is not moving to 360 hertz when the motor is moving. All of this is clearly now over my head, and I put this question to you, the audience, to help me figure out what I have done wrong and what I have managed to accidentally do right. And whoa, what's that? Oh, okay. Looks like it's time to like and subscribe. Thank you very much and have a nice day.